Is that there? We go. Cool. Mm -hmm. Hello, hello and welcome to uh, Symposium 12, entitled Information Extraction from Digital Specimen Images Using Artificial Intelligence. Uh, at the moment, there are a lot of initiatives going around the world regarding the information extraction using artificial intelligence. In this session, we would like to bring up some techniques and some experts together. With this, I would like to invite our first speaker, Lawrence Livingmore from Natural History Museum, London. He is presenting about specimen data refinery. Thank you. Um, so before I start, I wanted everyone to know that all of the slides and the associated information are available in Figshare with project links and examples. So why make the SDR? I wanted to talk a little bit about why we started the project. So on a normal day, our digitization team creates thousands of specimen images. And these are used to capture minimal data in a semi-automated way. What the specimen is, where it's physically stored, along with a unique identifier. Sometimes we also capture additional information if it's cheap and relatively easy to do so. But that still leaves a whole lot of other potential data that we would want to capture. And this is usually done subsequently um, usually through manual transcription and manual georeferencing. This latter stage of record enhancement is time consuming, challenging, and it doesn't scale particularly well. And for some of the types of data that we should be considering and recording, we should be thinking about provenance and methodology a bit more carefully and consistently. So a solution we proposed as part of the synthesis project many years ago now it feels, was using a workflow and fair digital object-based approach, which is similar to what DISCO is proposing now. And a few of you have seen workflows already in this symposium, and it's been great to see a few examples of Galaxy, but essentially a workflow is a series of tools or actions that operate on a data set that run in sequence as a batch operation. So you've got tool A, B, C, D, and everything kind of runs through it. I'm not going to define fair digital objects today, but there's quite a lot of other stuff um, linked in here because um, that wouldn't really last in 10 minute talk. But why use workflows? Well, 
Um, they abstract things, so your users are shielded from the complexity if they don't need or want to see it. Um, it makes it easier for reporting, reusing, evolving, sharing, um, and comparing workflows. Workflows support automation, so you can run consistent pipelines to act on your data, or in our case, images, um, and automate the computational aspects. They also deal with provenance. So you capture provenance with each step in the workflow with logs. You have full data lineage. They support auto documentation. Um, you have traceable evolution, audit, transparency, which makes everything hopefully reproducible. And then finally, scaling. So this workflow-based approach, especially if you're using a workflow manager platform like Galaxy, allows you to make use of HPC, cloud compute, but also just local VMs as well. So you've got different kinds of scaling to support different kinds of needs. And that allows you to process small to very large amounts of data. And all of these things make workflows fair. So what does the SDR look like at the moment? So again, we've seen a few examples of Galaxy. Most of the stuff kind of happens in the middle. Galaxy is not the most beautiful platform, um, but it kind of gets the job done. This is, um, I'll zoom in onto the next one, but this is a, a whole list of workflows. And on a workflow, you'll typically see a little bit of metadata describing what a workflow does. We've got some tags here that tell you what it works on and when we last tested it. So, and, and workflows can be set up so that in you can have a whole set of default workflows. So when someone logs in, they've got a whole set of basic ones with example data that they can run through. This is an example of an 11 component workflow with a, a number of tools in. And it's worth noting that this kind of thing is relatively drag and drop, kind of like Yahoo pipes, if any of you remember that. So what is actually going on in this workflow that you can't see? So over on the left-hand side, all of these chain of tools are all about input pro file processing and how we deal with a fair digital object creation. And in this case, that's an open digital specimen. Again, I'm not going to dwell too much on what that is, but it's basically a JSON object that lists a whole bunch of structured data about the specimen. This kind of orange bit those are a whole bunch of tools. Some of these run in series, and one of them, I think, in this case, runs in parallel. And then finally, these get packaged up in an RO crate, which is essentially a fancy zip file with some good quality metadata in it about the workflow run. The interesting thing about this is quite easy to swap out this section and reconnect stuff so you've got the kind of creation, processing, and the output bit, there's a kind of standalone reusable elements. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the overall technical approach. So we've tried to stick with open source tools um, as much as possible um, and contemporary approaches. So I've already mentioned Galaxy, which is the platform that everything is running on. Workflows can be deposited in Workflow Hub, which is a registry for workflows, so you can save your, your workflows and get identifiers for those. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these two sections in the middle, so how we're handling deployment, um, and a little bit about the tooling as well. Um, there is a separate talk that is going to happen in a, a symposium very soon about fair digital objects and RO Crate. There's a lot of stuff online if you're curious about that. So Ansible, this is a way of um, essentially how we handle deployment onto servers of both the Galaxy platform and the SDR specific components. What you really know to, need to focus on is these kind of bits at the bottom, um, but for developers, this is uh, really useful. It allows you to formalize all of the processes, the system administration, and allow different sysadmins to kind of share um, record and describe the actions that they're performing to basically set up a server. Um, and since these processes are all formalized, automation for this whole process becomes possible, possible. So you're essentially using scripts, playbooks in Ansible speak to get this done. 
Um, and these can apply to different systems that need to be managed. So it means that we can set up an instance of the SDR at the University of Manchester and in London, and hopefully our colleagues at Naturalis can set it up. And if you guys wanted to set it up locally to run some of the examples, it would be easy for you to do too. So it's kind of like a best practice approach to what would otherwise be manual server management. So how are we doing? This is um, a selection of images from our segmentation tool. It's a bit of a mixed bag, but this is still relatively early days for the model that we trained manually on about 200 examples. So you can see there's a, a fair bit of underfitting on some of these. Our model didn't see too many examples on that. And it's a pattern that I've seen in Lepidoptera before, where you've got interesting wing patterns and they're picked up as like false positives on barcodes and things like that. Pretty confident that we can fix that with a bit of uh, retraining. But it's done reasonably well on that kind of second row, which is a bit more typical for um, what we trained it on. The next bit, um, text lines. So again, I'd say a similar-ish pattern. So if you look at the kind of second rows and stuff, it's done okay-ish, but it could do with a bit more um, uh, training to increase the accuracy. Now, I'm not going to talk about this bit too much because my colleague Ben is going to talk about text analysis. But this was, um, a, I'd say, an atypical example, actually. It was just the first one in my random sample. It just happens to have a lot of text. But you can see there's a fair bit of reasonable text out of this. And again, we were aiming for a 20% word error rate and a 5% character error rate, which we've not achieved yet. But we still think that that is achievable. Um, and Ben will talk about a bit more about this and other platforms uh, in later talks. We've also attempted a bit of named entity recognition and barcode reading, but I don't have time to show those today. Another thing I briefly want to talk about, just flowing some big things. Um, I guess we've just tried to talk, um, use fair digital objects and it's proven to be quite challenging. They tend to obscure things for the user um, in a couple of different ways. So when you're thinking about the data types that go into the tools, the prerequisites of tools, um, for some workflow managers, they don't work particularly well. They could create issues with how you're managing uh, workflows. They can provide is issues with integration. And they also make debugging challenging because if you need to feed through a whole sequence of things in and you have to feed it through with that particular object, it's, it's tricky. So, we're at a kind of closed beta stage. If anyone wants to try, we can set you up so you can have a play with the SDR, but we're hoping to have a few more kind of public instances soon. We're focusing on testing HPC deployment, model refinement, wider user testing, documentation, and making recommendations for next steps. Um, I'd say just for conclusion, having more image metadata and training data would be really helpful. I think the workflow approach is promising, but we need a bit more model refinement and more tools to make this more broadly useful to you guys. Um, I think it's interesting to see a few more examples of Galaxy being used at this conference. So are we seeing Galaxy convergence? And something that's been worrying me is like, how do we get to um, achieve usable innovation? So these are all kind of really cool things and cool ideas, but how do we get these nicely structured files and flatten them so we get into our collection management systems, for example. So, yeah, but anyway, those are kind of the things that are playing on my mind. I'd like to thank my synth partners, um, especially technical partners at University of Manchester and Techlia. Um, thank you for listening. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, do we have any questions uh, here in the in-room participants? How does Galaxy hold, handle the, uh, the vast volumes? Because images are, are big things and, uh, and also the data too. We've not had any issues so far. Some of the tools struggle um, with higher, res well, bigger files. 
So running TIFFs wouldn't make sense. We've mostly been doing uh, most of the operations on JPEGs, but it's not been an issue so far. We've, we've more had issues with compute with how we've dockerized everything and spinning up a Docker uh, container every time we want to run at all. That's computationally inefficient and quite heavy. So the, the containerized approach has been more of an issue than processing images really so we're just thinking about how we might want to modify the tools to be a bit more galaxy-esque um but yeah it's not been an issue so far what are you doing so we have the time for one quick question okay so with this, I would like to invite second speaker, Ariana Salili James from Natural History Museum. She will be presenting about LA software, machine learning on computer vision for automatic label extraction. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, awesome. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Alice software and how we're going to use machine learning and computer vision to extract label information from them. Before I start, this is a bit of a different talk. I come from a math background, so I suppose it's a bit of a mathsy-ish talk, but with not much maths. I come from an applied geometry background, and my supervisor always said your slides should just have fun shapes on them and figures. So that's what you're going to get. Okay, so the first the questions are. What, why, and how? What are we doing? So let's start with that one. What is ALICE? ALICE stands for Angled Label Image Capture Equipment. So essentially it's this machine, think of it as a machine, you've got cameras angled at different places and you put your pin specimen inside. So there'll be four angles here and there'll be one, sorry, four cameras here. There'll be a camera at the top and then the camera at the front as well. But we're only, we only care about the four up here. We don't care about the lateral or cell view of the specimen because all I care about is the labels. Other people might care about other stuff. <laughs> okay. And the aim is when you take photos with Alice and you get your bunch of photos, can we automatically get those labels out? And can we transcribe what's on those labels? Which might sound easy, but sometimes specimens cover the labels. Sometimes pins cover the labels. Sometimes you get the biggest wings ever or really bendy labels. So it can be rather tricky. Okay, why are we doing this? We wanna speed up the digitization process. Otherwise it's gonna take forever to do this. The other thing is we wanna help the digitizers. So, because right now they have to go through the four different images of the labels and try and put them together. Can we find a way of merging the labels so they don't have to do this? And also we just wanna learn about cool machine learning. Where else can we apply ML? Where else can we apply maths and things like that? Okay, how are we gonna do this? So this is the recipe. So the first step will be label finding. So you've got your four images. Can we locate those labels on the images? Oh, I Okay, then we want to merge the labels together. And lastly, we want to transcribe the labels. I'm gonna focus on the first two because we're gonna keep transcription separate in our system. Okay, so this is step one. So step one, that's what Alice does, that's not me. We look at the four photos. So again, we're ignoring the lateral and dorsal view of the specimen. Step two, this is where machine learning comes in. So we wanna use a convolutional neural network, which I won't talk about, but I, oh, should I say sorry? I won't talk about, but I've added a link to the CNN that we're actually using. And the way that works is, sorry, I have small ears. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello? Oh. Okay, so the way this works essentially, it kind of finds bounding boxes. So look at your image, kind of split it up into grids, which of the grids contain, might contain a label in it. And then it uses that information to create regions of interest essentially, but I won't go into that too much. But we trained it on just a few things. We trained it on around 500 or so images, which isn't that much for a CNN classification. And that was to find the labels, but we also trained it on some pins as well, so it can find a pin in case that's useful for us. And as you can see, it's done a fairly good job, but they're not perfect. They're not rectangular. They're, they're okay though. They're quite good, I would say. 
So this brings us on to step three. So step three, we want a parallelogram essentially. We want a nice rectangular label here. So this is where we get into the math side of things. And I'm incredibly biased, so I didn't want to trust the CNN too much. So I wanted to do some more maths on the side. So one of the ways we find this, bound, this rectangular box is we look for the biggest diagonal that the CNN found. And then we use various tricks to find the corners from there. For example, if you've got your diagonal, can we have, so take your line, rotate it a bit and see where you can find a 90 degree angle. Some tricks like that to try and approximate where your box lies. Okay, step four. Step four is segmenting it. So once you've got that, you want to remove everything else. We only care about the label. And also just in case the corner finding code didn't work well, you want to add a safety net there as well. So I don't trust it hundred percent. Let's add like a 5% layer around that box to make it look at a bigger segment essentially. Okay, step five, we have our labels, but we're in a kind of weird space at the moment. They're all tilted in some other angle. We want to be in a nice 2D perspective over here, which brings us on to maths again, yay which I won't go on too much about, but the important word here is the word homography or perspective transformation. So whichever you prefer to remember, remember one of those, and then we can talk about it later. But all it does is it looks confusing, but all you're doing is you're submitting those four corners. It's, they're just X and Y axes. And then you also submit where you want it to actually be. Where you want it to actually be is on that 2D projection. And then it's just the case of finding a matrix so you want to find that homography matrix H, and that's all there is. It's just algebra. So if you remember your school algebra, it's just that. It just looks fancy, but really it's just algebra. And also, I should say that it's one line of code that some other fancy library made, so it's quite easy to do. Okay, so you've got that, but as you can see, that some of them are upside down, some of them are angled weirdly. We want these to be angled in a similar way. We want them to be fairly aligned with each other, because we, we want to merge them together. If they're not aligned well, they're going to merge very badly. So what can we do now? Well, again, maths. So we want to match these labels. You pick one label, pick whichever one you want, or you can choose a slightly um, sneakier method of finding your favorite one. And then you want to align the rest to that. So one way we look at it is we try and approximate the angle of a label. So for example, look for horizontal lines, which, which of these four images has the most concrete horizontal lines? Or you can even do basic OCR tests, so um, optical character recognition tests to see which one has the most letters. Maybe that's your favorite one. And then align the others to that. So then you'll get, an, they're, they're all fairly more aligned. So if you saw in the previous step, one of them was upside down. But at least now they're all fairly aligned. Okay, the main part now is coming up, the label merging. So you want to merge the label so you have one label together. I'm sorry if it looks quite blurry to you, but it's actually okay on my laptop. But we want to merge the labels together, and it sounds complicated, but it's actually really easy this step. All we're doing is averages, essentially. In this example, you go through every pixel and you just compute the median value. So if, if Let's pretend these were grayscaled images. Grayscaled colors are zero to a hundred, depending on how you're looking at it. You just take the median value. So again, this is school math essentially. There are other ways to do it where you can look at the maximum value, for example, if you want your figure to be darker or things like that. Okay, and then the last step is the transcription. So this step I have not worked on much and I've just used a very basic um, transcription algorithm, uh, sorry, an optical character recognition algorithm to try and approximate the letters that are on this label. And it's not done that terribly. It's found Ecuador and Santiago. It struggled a bit with the numbers. It didn't find the 1,100 meters, but it did manage to find everything else. And this was on a binarized version of the merge label. So binarized, I just mean a black and white image. So use your favorite binarization technique and binarize your image, or you can threshold it. So Think of like everything below this color should be black, everything above this color should be white. But I won't go into too much detail about that. Okay, so the fine print is that it takes around 20 seconds at the moment to um, do the CNN section. So for the CNN to find the masks, that is quite slow, but everything else is really, really quick. 
The other thing I didn't mention was um, pin hiding. We do find the pins um, with the CNN. Sometimes we, we've looked at hiding the pins. So you know where your pin lies. Let's just make it a different color. Let's try and blur it with the background. That's something we um, sometimes do. And the other thing is sometimes specimens have more than one labels together. So you do need to decide which labels you're gonna merge. You don't wanna merge the top label of, from one image to the bottom label of another. Okay. And there's things like that. And look, the last thing I wanted to say was there is slightly, there's more CNN stuff happening as well. We actually do some classification to try and detect the bad labels in the end. Because if you get a really bad label, you don't really want that in, going into your database. So we want to detect the bad labels and try and either redo them or flag them for someone to look at. Um, okay, so the to do list, we want to speed things up. And uh, we want to test the accuracy of each step, which is really important. And we obviously want to deploy it so people can use it in the museum. But there's also something else that I've highlighted here. And that brings me to Cobot, which I've got 30 seconds to talk about. It's something that we're thinking of using at the museum. Well, I say use, we're fantasizing about it essentially and hoping to maybe one day use Cobots. How can these be useful? So Cobots just stands for collaborative robots. Can we use that to find our labels instead? So what we were thinking, which I made with the Ubuntu version of Paint, so I do apologize, but we were thinking, how about having a robot arm with a camera on it? So the camera can locate a label, zoom into it, and then automatically read it, which I made sound easy, which is ridiculously tricky, as I'm sure you all know. That's one thing we want to start looking at. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. And I have to take questions and time. So yeah, thank you. Do we have any questions? Hi there, Toivo here. Uh, do you use any synthetic data to train your uh, AI? Uh, well, currently I'm just using, uh, what do you mean by synthetic data? Like uh, with uh, some procedural uh, blender proc algorithm you can like, Mitch and match images like uh, twist and change the colors. No, we're not using anything like that. I, I was just using the images that we've already got from Alice so far. That's all I've all I've used at the moment. But it could be something to to look at, especially when we want to do the bad label detection and we need more data. Synthetic data is prop, might be something that we'll look into using. Talk to you later. <laughs> Uh, I had a question concerning the data that you are using also. What kind of supervision do you have? Are you like, uh, what kind of outputs do you have in order to train your model? Did you? Um, oh, okay, no, I can't do that. Um, can I get this back? By clicking something? Oh, okay. Okay, so the training data is, are you asking about the train on the training side? Yeah. Yeah, so the training data will just be these four images for every specimen. Okay, but that, like that's the output of the model. I'm, ask, I'm asking about the desired output. Do you have like humans annotating your data or is it just unsupervised? Uh, I think maybe a bit of both, I suppose. I think one idea would be for the output was to just have the merge label and then the text as well. And then I think in my head, the idea was that a human would then look at that to verify the text with, with the merge label, but the merge label will be the main output here. So not the binarized version, but yeah, this nice blurry thing over here. Okay. Yeah, if there is any further questions, please post in our Slack channel. So thanks, Rihanna. And this time we move to next presenter, Ben Scott. He is from Natural History Museum and presenting about cloud AI, a comparison of specimen image data extraction process. And he is presenting virtually. Hi, yeah, thank you very much. I will just share my screen.
Hi everyone. Can you um can you all see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Um so today I'm going to be talking about uh clay, cloud AI and how well services from Google, Amazon, and Azure perform extracting textual information from specimen labels, and particularly in comparison to the uh, specimen data refinery that you've um, just heard about from my colleague, Lawrence. Um, so the SDR, I won't go over it again, because um, hopefully you've got a pretty good understanding of it from, um, from Lawrence. But um, essentially, it's um, it will take a input specimen image and go through an, a series of tasks to um, to, to read the text from that um, from that image. So it will identify the lines, the labels, and then do a OCR on the um, on the text. Um, it does other stuff besides that, but I'm just going to be looking at this part of the workflow, the bit outlined in red. Um, so the inspiration for this talk is um, earlier in the year, myself and Lawrence were chatting to a um, an engineer from Google. And he, um, he happened to mention that he thought a lot of the work that we're doing with the SDR could be, um, could be performed by the, um, the Google services just out of the box without any training. Um, yeah, just um, it, it could extract the text that we wanted in a much simpler way. Um, we were both a bit skeptical, um, knowing how messy our, our label um, images are the text on them and also we thought it was just a, an engineer sort of picking up their um picking up their products but what i wanted to do was examine examine his claim and compare um his his products with those of amazon and azure who offer similar text from image services um okay so how am i performing this evaluation are uh, the sdr supports three object types, um, herbarium sheets, pinned insects, and microscope slides. So I have selected 50 each of these objects um, from the NHM data portal and then transcribed the key textual elements we need to capture. So the what, the taxonomic name, when, where, and who collected it. Um, on the labels, this information is a mixture of, um, of handwritten and typewritten. It's about 20 to 80 split. Um, I know 150 isn't a huge evaluation data set, but hopefully it's enough to give an indication. And yeah, I'd like to rerun this with um, more data in the future. Um, the problem is finding these uh, verbatim transcriptions who haven't already used as training data sets for the SDR isn't easy. And yeah, it's very time consuming to um, hand tra transcribe all of, these, all of these pieces of information. Um, to evaluate the accuracy of the predicted text against the transcriptions, I first needed to identify the field value in the OCR text. Um, labels have a lot of extra information on them, long notes regarding provenance, redeterminations. Um, and whilst this information is important, it's not the vital information we want to extract as part of the digitalization process. And if the OCR comparison um, doesn't reflect the data we need, it sort of muddies the, uh, the evaluation sort of water. Um, but once I have the OCR text, I use a sequence matcher to identify the text representing the taxonomic name, the date, um, and so on. Once I found that text, I then calculate the Levenstein ratio between the transcription and the OCR. Um, so the Levenstein distance is the number of changes needed to transform one word or phrase into another. So adding, subtracting, or replacing letters. Uh, the fewer the changes, the better. And then by subtracting and dividing by the word length, we get a nice score out of 100. So that's the Levenstein ratio. And that's the, uh, the, the, the metric you'll see in the following slides. Um, I haven't included other evaluations like pixel accuracy or label segmentation because uh, we're just feeding the images into these services and looking at the text return. So any internal segmentation is happening in the cloud. Um, the only data processing I've performed is clustering the sentences into labels. I need to do this so I can join the text together in the correct order. Um, so where text uh, spans multiple lines, I need to be able to join it together um, into one sentence. Uh, so to do this, I've used a simple k-means clustering algorithm, grouping each of the sentences based on the centroid of the bounding box. 
Um, so let's have a look at some results. And first, I'll benchmark the SDR, um, the specimen data refinery. So it performs, yeah, really well. Uh, the median taxonomic ratio was 96. Um, so many of the results are close to that perfect score of 100. Um, less, less good to the other, other properties. Collector median was um, 81. Uh, locality 87 and date 86 and a much wider spread of accuracy and um, the outliers you can see at the bottom are uh, where the sequence matcher can couldn't find any text that was a good fit so the word was um, completely lost but yeah very few of those um, and let's have a look at our first uh, cloud offering amazon ors uh, they offer a, ser a service called recognition uh, which reads both printed text and handwriting from images uh, it's the trickiest um, service to use. You need to submit the image in one call and then retrieve the JSON results in another. So polling the, um, the service until it's been processed. But yeah, it's pretty speedy. Um, so I submitted the same test images and actually getting pretty similar results to the SDR. Um, but yeah, worse performance than the SDR on um, taxonomic names. Um, next up, Azure. And they provide an API under their cognitive services computer vision, which is called Read in Stream. Um, and this, again, can be used for handwritten and um, typewritten text extraction. Um, they have other services for just printed text, which are yeah, equally as good. And yeah, as you can see here, really quite good results, improving on the accuracy on um, collector and date. Um, and this one was a bit of a dark horse. Um, yeah, if you can say something like from Microsoft is some bit of an unknown service, but it wasn't really the first cloud AI provider I would select for something like this. Um, but actually the, the really impressive results show how important document processing is um, for text extraction in business services. And it's why so many of these excellent services are now, um, are now available for us to use. And lastly, our inspiration for this, um, Google. So this is using the um, Google's vision API and like the others it's just a, a web service but we're running this on the um, on the Google Cloud uh, it's just a few lines of Python code scanning a directory for um, for new files and then feeding through the vision API um, but yeah as you can see really really impressive results um, and let's just compare all of them together um, yeah the SDR, as you can see, is yeah, really good for taxonomic data, but yeah, falls down. But on other other services, on other units, where Azure and Google, the performance is is really superb. Um, Amazon's struggling a little bit, especially with the um, the dates, and I, I don't think it's struggling with the um, the number values here, but the um, the punctuation included in many of the date fields. Um, so yeah, that's two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, yeah, really excellent from the, uh, the Google, the other cloud services. Um, yeah, the costs, cloud cloud services, really, really very cheap. Um, Amazon, one million images a month is like just over a thousand um, thousand pounds. Azure, similar similar price point. Google, five thousand pounds for two hundred and fifty images. So really, much much cheaper than anything we can develop ourselves. Um, so conclusions. Um, what does this mean for the SDR? In some ways, it's excellent news uh, because the, um, the SDR is modular, so we can drop in a, a, a new service anytime we like. Um, but, the, um, but it does beg the question, I mean, do, should we just embrace a cloud ecosystem and run all of our workflows on the, the Google infrastructure? Um, and also, is MLOps a better way of approaching this than, than workflows themselves built in Galaxy, or can we combine uh, those two approaches? Um, and lastly, what does this mean for our digitization pipelines in general? Um, as I have demonstrated, cloud services are excellent at extracting our accurate textual data from, from our labels. So really that part of the problem is solved. And that allows us to focus on the next piece of the puzzle with all that nice OCR text. How do we pull out the correct taxonomic name from the multiple determinations, disambiguate the collector? Um, and so, yeah, with, with these cloud services, we can now start examining like how do we actually do something useful with that um, with that data. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say thank you for uh, Christina and Lawrence for providing the data, the Galaxy Dev team and um, our SDR.
project partners um, and some links to the SDR project at the end. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? Thanks, Ben. That was a that was a really great talk. It's Nikki from Q. Hey. I'm interested to know how how often are those uh, models changing? Like, if you were to run this process every couple of months, are they are they being updated? Are you going to get quite different results? Um, yeah, I looked at this, the Google one, and um, they do update their model um, really quite frequently. I'd have to get back to you, back to you with the um, exact figures, but yeah, it's constantly sort of being improved and augmented. And I guess they're like adding new data to it yeah, all the time, quite regularly. But yeah, for the um, Azure and um, Amazon, yeah, I, I didn't look at how frequently they're updating theirs. Hi Ben, um, were all the labels English and, and how does the these engines um, cope with languages? Um, yes, all English, um, yeah, transcribed by, by me. Um, so yeah, I just focused on the English ones from the uh, using the data portal. I haven't tested how they work in other languages. But yeah, something to look at, I think. Oh, uh, Michal here, uh, Michal Terma. Uh, I might have an answer to you. We actually just tested recently the this um, Vision API for Russian handwritten text, and it performs surprisingly well for from Google API at least for on the herbarium specimens. We tested the same thing. Uh, mine is not really a question, but maybe the idea that this kind of testing might be interesting for natural language processing part which goes after that like once you extract the text itself then you might need to find out what it is what uh, what you're looking at and we test it and we are in process of maybe applying it in, pra in, in practice to uh, use uh, nlp processing api from google as well to extract the name of the uh, collector and the taxon and the location it seems to work now we are still working on that at all so oh, very interesting yeah that would be um uh, my next steps I'd, I'd love to catch up about about that with you we have questions from online it's from nico granzo do you need to tell the system from the label what type of data it is or it figures on its own. Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? So the question is, uh, do you need to tell the system from the label what type of data it is, or it figures out on its own? Ah, uh, yeah, my um. So I'm I'm just um. If that's part of my evaluation process. Yeah. So it's um the good the cloud services are not um figuring out what what the data is that would be um as a, the previous sub questioner um said like a downstream nlp and um, ner process um within the cloud thanks ben uh it's time we move to the next presenter it's asin bakis Unfortunately, he is not here. So we are going to next presentation. It's from Monica Gonzalez Alonso from the University of Navarra, Spain. And it's a recorded video. Thank you, Chair. Hi, good afternoon, good to see you again. In this talk, we will share some advances on incorporating a potential source of biodiversity data that has a sort of a dual use. It is both basic science and very practical data as well for millions of people, those with hay fever. That is using the vast flow of airborne pollen and spore data coming from air monitoring programs, as long as we can ensure an adequate standardization throughout the entire workflow. Airborne pollen concentrations correlate in time and space to the relative population of plant subwind. 
That is to say that pollen tracks back to the presence of plants, although with certain limitations, of course. For example, identification is taxonomically coarse, as we often refer to pollen types representing groups of species. And location is conditioned by the transport range of pollen, while the detection is time sensitive. Anyway, as long as we recognize and factor in those limitations, pollen can be a reliable, a reliable proxy for plant occurrences within a range. So while the main uses of those, data, of those data is medical and related to public health, pollen data has been used, among other things, to model how climate change pressures biodiversity. For instance, by altering the phenology. And then we can use the phenological changes back to predict what will happen with ecosystems. Or perhaps tracking new problems, for example, to forecast new invasives down the line as they ride environmental shifts while warning doctors about potential new threats to patients. Pollen data series become veritable indicators, environmental traces, if you like, as they do shift in response to past, present, and future environments. This is possible because we get copious data from an extensive network of monitoring stations that produce long time series of daily data from many places. That is to say, in Darwin Core parlance, extensive sampling events. Also, will to provide a rather desirable auditing by the rest of the data, that is, confirmed absences. Interestingly, we have two types of monitors manual stations in blue here and automatic stations in red. But manual traps of number automatic samples part one. Why? Well, because manual stations have been up and running for decades, and automated ones have only recently been marketed at a very high prices. Manual stations require significant labor and expertise through, because pollen grains are identified and counted by experts looking at microscopic samples that need to be collected and processed. On the other hand, automatic systems rely on a variety of techniques and quite often on image analysis to identify and count in an unsupervised manner. They certainly reduce manual labor and can help reducing human error as well, although they can also and certainly do introduce errors of their own. But the interesting thing is that manual samples can also produce images as long as you have simply a camera and a microscope. And image recognition is a rapidly mature field. Therefore, there is room for improvement in the manual workflow. By resorting to, for instance, AI on these images, as well as improving the accuracy of automatic samples using, for example, convolutional neural networks. This is what we have tried here. And now Monica will show you some results and proposals for a particular ticket case that she and more recently Jaime here have been working on. Uh, Monica, please. Convolutional neural networks have proven to get results in object detection and classification. Also in the biological world, with some architectures rather promising judging by use frequency. However, the automation of a species identification and indeed that of pollen and spores too presents many challenges. First, the scarcity of training data, which usually requires a tedious manual labeling task that has to be done or validated by experts. Second, the task of separating the object from the background or other objects, that is segmentation. In pollen, real world images are often less than ideal as compared to training images. For example, the breeze and air bubbles beset samples collected by traps, as in this. An algorithm can be quite precise with some objects, it can also struggle to classify others. For example, in a study of the performance of the automatic monitor BIA 500, we observed that while it is quite good overall, some taxa are prone to misclassifications. Or in this other case, for the pollen sense image based trap. When validating the system's automatic data with a collocated reference manual trap during the spring season in Munich, some species had good correlations, while others were, to put it mildly, less than ideal. A possible explanation is the training set, which might be rather localized. And then we come to another challenge. Are algorithms portable? Can they be used in other locations or with images in different conditions? For example, the devices tested in Munich against reference European traps have been trained with American specimens collected with devices not used in Europe. Algorithms may need to be fine-tuned and localized. 
In another example, we developed an algorithm able to detect the highly allergenic alternaria spores from images of the BAA500 because it didn't exist. Training images were pre-processed images. While some additional training is still desirable, we got quite good segmentation and recognition results. However, when applying this same algorithm to manual microscopy images, it didn't work well. We then set to develop another CNN for images from manual instruments. We selected five allergenic taxa and added a noise class to introduce the debris present on the images. We developed a segmentation step with classical algorithms and then modified the upper layers of a pre-trained BGG-16, adding incremental classes. We obtained quite good results with an average of one score of 0.9 when discriminating six classes. However, once again, when running the algorithm on all samples to retrieve occurrences of, for those classes, we got an excess of false positives. The archive slides had lost much contrast and proved a top not to crack for the neural network. And we are considering a specific retraining for ages the slides. Finally, automation may be challenging in the handling of the produced data and metadata. While monitoring programs are best suited for the sampling event section of the Darwin Core standard, they can spawn an awful load of data. Monitoring devices could, in theory, produce one primary record for each single detection. For example, this taxon has been detected here and at this time, but that quickly becomes impractical and the sample concept is rather more appropriate. More properly, the device's data should be time aggregated, producing one sampling event per each defined time slot. In fact, there is already a project trying to get this sample data up to a standard. And we'll also have to deal with the heaps of metadata that can be necessary for the proper functioning of the recognition algorithms. Should they be kept and incorporated into the standards? Which ones and which ones are critical and which ones could be left is open to discussion. In summary, then, standardizing the vast amount of data that polymentary produces has to overcome a number of challenges. Defining a standard extension dealing with the issue of the taxon level, its recognition probability, and the multiple taxon attribution of the spores or pollen, the intrinsic precision of the provenance as opposed to the exact location of, of the sample, a problem not shared by many other sampling events, or the variable time frames and time spans of the occurrence data. But we believe that all this is eventually necessary to properly tap this vast source of useful data. Finally, we'd like to thank the people of our team and also Professor Potters for lending us the equipment. And also thank you all, all of you for listening. And now we are open to questions. Thank you all. Do we have questions here? Okay. Uh, Monica, there is a there is hello. Hello. Yeah. So Monica, there is a question for you by Chandra in Slack. So how well are these tools doing across different handwritings? We have images of journals full of handwritten text, and I'm unsure if this can be OCR'd well. Hi, everybody. So I saw what um, did Tendra, but uh, our algorithm do not uh, detect handwritten handwritings. It's just for image recognition. So sorry, I, I am reading again because I'm sure we have images. Okay, so what I, I'm not sure if I am understanding the question, but the thing is, if we can get these images from handwritten papers, I would say it's probably that you are able to, to recognize that. Uh, sorry, Monica, uh, that, uh, that question was uh, for the previous 
uh, presenter. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any further question? Hello. Uh, any further questions? If you have any questions, please post in the Slack or maybe use discussion section at the end. So by that time, Arturo will join. So you can ask him directly if you have any further questions. And now we are going to move to the next presentation from Asin Bakins. Asin Bakis, sorry. So now he's online. So he's from Tulane University, Louisiana, and he's speaking about extraction landmark and trade information from segmented digital specimen images generated by artificial neural networks. Hi everyone, I am Yasin Bakush. I am from Tulane University Biodiversity Research Institute. And uh, today my talk is about a workflow that we are working on currently. And that workflow is about uh, extracting uh, landmarks specifically from uh, fish images. And uh, this study is uh, we started uh, this study with uh, NSF HDR uh, grant, uh, Biology Guided Neural Networks project. And we are continuing uh, that project with the Imageomics project, which is the continuum of the uh, same uh, project. And uh, uh, we are using biological uh, guidance uh, for the developing uh, machine learning uh, methods. And we are using specifically, our group is using specifically fish images, uh, 2D fish images uh, that are collected from the museums. And in this, uh, in this pipeline, uh, I'm going to mention about this specific uh, ontology guided uh, trade segment uh, extraction, uh, trade extraction uh, workflow. So our, uh, we have, four different workflows. The first one is uh, data management. And uh, we, we have already uh, presented, uh, published this workflow uh, in the uh, recent years in another uh, TADWIC uh, conference. And now we are publishing or presenting the data extraction workflow in this presentation. And it will follow with data analysis workflow and machine learning workflow. So the idea here is how, to, how do we uh, extract all this data from the, uh, how do we collect all this data from the museums? And then uh, how do we extract the traits, the trait information? And then how do we analyze what is the uh, analysis uh, pipeline look like? And then how do we use all those information in the uh, machine learning uh, pipelines? So in the current presentation, I am going to mention about the data extraction workflow. Our input is uh, to the fish images. Uh, they come along with uh, some metadata and we uh, extract some more metadata uh, from those images. And basically what we are doing is creating a, a list of images and a list of metadata as input. And uh, we are using uh, cleaning filtering uh, pipelines for that purpose. Uh, we have an image quality uh, metadata that we have generated. Uh, I will mention about in the uh, following slides. And we are using all those for creating a list uh, creating a subset of data. And then we are validating the segmentation images. Segmentation has already been done uh, with another lab. So we are going to use their images. Uh, we have been collaborating with them uh, for that purpose. And uh, we are uh, validating all those segmentations by using uh, fish counts, like how many fish or how many specimens are in that data set, because sometimes there are more objects coming uh, from those uh, original images. 
or uh, sometimes uh, there are uh, positioning issues. And uh, if, if those, are, uh, those images are coming from different batches, different data sets, then there are always some batch effect. And uh, there is size and shape related issues. I will mention some of those in the following slides again. And uh, then we assign a scoring uh, for each of those segmentations based on those validations. And in the next pipe, uh, in the next item in the pipeline, uh, we are extracting landmarks. And this is the main topic that I am going to uh, be uh, presenting today. Uh, we will be extracting uh, uh, vectors, landmarks, and then uh, try to fine tune them and apply procrastis analysis and uh, calculate standard deviations and uh, create spacious profiles at the end. And um, uh, some of those landmarks are coming from centroids, which are automatically calculated by using the areas. And we create landmark data. After that, we use uh, uh, we validate all those landmarks by using uh, manually generated, uh, manually collect, entered, uh, captured landmark information, and then we continue with the rest of the pipeline. And uh, this includes uh, converting those landmarks into uh, either using them in the morphometrics kind of analysis uh, or uh, extracting uh, morphological traits. So our landmarking process is uh, looks like this. And this is the original image on the left up. And we are... Uh, we are calculating the bonding box in the first case. Uh, and then uh, it depends on the number of fishes. It could be, uh, that could be more than uh, one uh, specimens or uh, bonding boxes generated from the same original image. This image comes from the used museums and um, all have uh, different features. Some of them uh, has labels, some don't. Some of them has uh, scale bars, some doesn't. And uh, Carpatna Lab has been uh, providing uh, us with those bonding boxes and the uh, uh, segmentation images. So from the bonding box, we, uh, they generated the uh, segmentation images and we generated the landmarks from those uh, segmentation images. And then we extract uh, all those landmarks as vectors and convert those vectors to measurements uh, by means of lengths, angles, areas, and etc. So we use two uh, image related metadata specifically uh, to fix the, uh, to clean and filter the data sets first, and then uh, validate the segmentation uh, files and then landmarking. And uh, one of them is image quality metadata, which we have captured manually. Uh, we developed a, uh, an interface to capture uh, those uh, metadata. Uh, the second one is automated image metadata. And, uh, another lab has uh, created a pipeline to capture this metadata automatically. And uh, our metadata is mostly related to the position and the uh, uh, status or situation of the uh, specimen on the image. And their metadata is mostly about the colors and counts and uh, areas or uh, parameters, those kind of information. So bonding box and segmentation is basically uh, like this. It is a uh, very handy uh, pipeline. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the problems in segmentation. So uh, some of those uh, segmented images are uh, has problems. Uh, it is sometimes shape related or aspect ratio related issues. Some of them has size related issues like this one is a juvenile, but it looks like a, a regular fish in the uh, in the bonding box image. So sometimes it is file size, 
the resolution effects uh, it a lot. And we have extracted all those uh, landmarks uh, from the literature. And this is our list of 35 landmarks. And uh, those are central mare based landmarks. Uh, they are basically the uh, central location of the uh, scenes of all of the body parts. And those are the uh, ontological or anatomical landmarks uh, that we were able to extract. We, we basically used the uh, uh, locations, uh, like what is the leftmost uh, part of the body or what is the uh, topmost part of the eye, those kind of things. And then we were able to extract 22 of out of those 35 uh, landmarks and we created uh, a list of a file, a CSV file, and uh, after that we turned them into uh, traits. So mainly the uh, problems with the landmarks are uh, they may not be uh, in the same in the location that they are uh, they were ex uh, expected to be. Like in this one, this is the eye. Uh, comparing to centroid, the uh, uh, topmost. Uh, part of the uh, topmost pixel uh, uh, segment is not the on the uh, same location. Similarly, uh, sometimes like centromere is not in the right position. So that's all. Thank you. Do we have questions? In the real world. How about the virtual world? Do we have nothing? Okay, interesting. Yeah. Hi, Yasin. This is Jitendra. Uh, thanks for your nice talk. I'm just interested to understand. Uh, when you are doing your segmentation followed, that is followed by doing the measurements. So I'm just wondering how you are doing that. And for segmentation, what method are you using? So we are not doing this segmentation part. We are using already segmented images. Uh, if, you, if you check my uh, last slide, you will see the... Uh, you will see uh, the GitHub uh, repository uh, for the segmentation. You can find the details in there. For the um, for the landmarks, extracting landmarks, we are basically uh, doing the using the logical operations. Uh, so each of those uh, landmarks uh, are defined in the papers as like for the snout tip of the uh, head, for example. So we are choosing the leftmost pixel from the head segment, those kind of things. Or uh, centroids are easy because it is the, uh, the centroid of the uh, total area. So it is automatically uh, calculated and all the others, we are writing scripts. We are going to be sharing all those scripts under the bgnn.tulane.edu. So if you visit uh, that link, uh, you will uh, you will be accessing the data. It is not it may not be there. Not everything will be there uh, immediately, but uh, in the following weeks, we will update this web page and everything will be there. Thanks. Any further questions? Thank you, Asin. Uh, Thank you. If there is any questions to any of the presenters, uh, here is a chance to ask them. And if there is no further questions, I will open up the discussion. I was going to wrap up if that's okay. <laughs> if, if, so, yeah, I mean, I think every year we have a tad rig and every year machine learning gets a bit closer to where we really want it to be. 
um, and it's great to see things put into workflows. It's great to see real live applications of things and some very accurate uh, machine learning, which I'm sure will improve next time we come back to it, Tad Week. Um, and uh, thank you to all the speakers today. Uh, thank you, Ramzi and uh, Jitendra uh, for moderating. And uh, I think it's dinner time, isn't it? <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Just a little gentle reminder, everyone, be here 9am for the field trip. Good. See you then. I believe so, yeah.